From the push she brought from the Bronx, New York. Welcome, podcast listeners. My name is Ellen Stewart, and I am the Pushy Broad from the Bronx. Happy New Year. 2021 is finally here, and it could not have come any faster. I am delighted to spend this time with you on my show, Women Who Push for More. Over the past couple of months in 2020, I've had some amazing women on this show. Please go back and take a look and see how they truly are women who have pushed for more. And also, they are, in my estimation and in their admittance, pushy broads. Because as you know, I think a pushy broad is powerful, unafraid, self-aware, hardworking, and young at heart. And with that in mind, I created a team of women, the Pushy Broad team, who share my sentiments, every one of them a woman who pushes for more, and every one of them a Pushy Broad. So, in that spirit, they decided to collaborate and sit down in front of me and tell me that the next woman in 2021 who should be interviewed because she pushes for more is none other than the pushy broad herself. So, in this episode, I hope to give you an in-depth look at who I am, how I came to be, and what I do, and more importantly, maybe, how I help. So, to help me in that endeavor today, I have one of our team, the illustrious M. Locke, who you probably know as M. Zodic. She's with me today and a part of my team. So, let's see what you can discover about the Pushy Broad. Hey, M. How are you? Happy New Year. Well, Happy New Year, Ellen. Thank you so much for inviting me to interview you today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I know lots of lots of our listeners are asking about me and what made me, made me decide to do all of this. So do you want me to get started or do you have something in mind you want to ask me? Well, there is plenty that I have in mind that I want to ask you. And first of all, I'm so happy that you ran through exactly what a pushy broad means to you, because that was one of my very first questions, knowing that when people hear the word pushy broad, it's not always with a positive view of what a pushy broad is in their mind. So I love that you gave us a breakdown of what pushy broads mean to you. And I really want to, in this interview, discover what makes you you, what makes Ellen Stewart the pushy broad from the Bronx. So I want to take it right back to the beginning at, at, at this early on. So this early on, I want to take it right back to the beginning, to your early beginnings. And I want to know what it was like. What were you like as a child? Were you a pushy broad from very young or did that come later on in life? Let's talk a bit about that. Well, for better or for worse, I think I was a pushy broad right from the beginning. Some kids stand out because they want to, because they see there's a better way and they want to speak up. But more than that, they have to have the courage to speak up, I believe. And I think that courage came from my parents, especially my father. I had always thought that my dad wanted a son as well as a daughter, and he was blessed enough to have that. But his first child was a daughter, and that was me. So I was the oldest. And being the oldest, he really took me under his wing. My dad was an independent man, and he decided that he would instill in me many of the principles of being independent. And that also meant standing up for what I believed in, and more importantly, not afraid to say it. Not in a way that would be derogatory or nasty, but just a way to tell people that I had a voice and I needed to be heard. And I never thought anything less than that. And I always saw my father do that. 
And that's a gift that I have taken with me to this day. And I look upon it as a gift. That truly is a wonderful gift for a parent to bestow upon their child. I believe there are many children out there and who have grown into adults who perhaps didn't have quite the same upbringing where they were taught to be seen and not heard, to sit quietly and to nod and to not rock the boat. So it's great that from such a young age, you had it instilled in you that it was okay to have opinions and it was okay to voice those opinions. Um, I would love to know a bit more about your mother. I can see you actually have some of your mother's drawings behind you. What was she like? My mother, I think, was an extremely um, unique individual. I look at her differently now than I think growing up. Growing up, I looked at her as this force behind my father, this silent but powerful force. And she also exuded her own independence, I believe, because she wasn't concerned with what anybody else said. She wasn't concerned with what her friends said. She wasn't interested in doing what everybody else was doing. And most importantly, she was extremely happy doing her own thing and being that kind of independent. So I got that independence and sense of self from her as well. And I got the ability to speak out from my father. So it was a really, really good mix. I did not, however, inherit my mother's talent. <laughs> she is an amazing artist. I mean, she was. She did pass a couple of years ago, uh, two months shy of 96 years old. So she did live a very long time. And I celebrate her life and think about her often. And of course, she's my inspiration behind me as the true pushy broad, because I can feel her pushing me forward. Especially in later years, she would tell me how proud she was of me and how much she believed in me. And if it's one thing anybody needs, it's to be believed in by their parents. The idea that whatever you do, your parents have faith in you. That's really wonderful. They really did give you such an incredible mix of being a free spirit, of being able to express yourself. And I, I disagree that you didn't inherit your mother's talent. Talent comes in many different forms and your talent, as we'll come on to a bit later, is certainly being able to reach into people and helping them to talk about the different things that are plaguing them and helping them to make changes in their lives, to make them stronger, more assertive, healthier, independent beings. Um, so I would say that's certainly one of your greatest talents. So I, I wouldn't say that you don't have uh, the any kind of talent. You certainly do, perhaps not drawing, but your mother did definitely pass down talent to you. I thank you and I appreciate it. And I'm glad I get to put it to good use. Oh, absolutely. And I, for one, have benefited from your talents, which again, we'll talk about in a little while. But a few months ago, we had a conversation which was so interesting to me. And you were telling me all about your various travels. And the way that we came on to this is that we were talking about evolutions. I was certainly going through my own evolution at the time. And you were telling me how many chapters in your life you've had, how many different Ellens you've been. And one of those has been being able to travel to incredible destinations. What were you doing that took you around the world to all of these incredible places? It's really true. I do believe that we all live a variety of lives. And when we understand that, each life makes it easier to go through. Because at the age that I am, here I am, um, certainly a late baby boomer, I can turn around and look at the passages in my life and understand that there are indeed passages. And if I had known that, of course, we always say hindsight is twenty twenty. But if I had known that earlier, then every single transition I made might have been much easier. Because we understand that we're going to get through it. 
and we're going to evolve like your pets, right? Like your like both of your snakes that shed their skin and go on to a new, a whole new thing. It's the same kind of thing. We shed the old and walk into the new. And sometimes that's painful or sometimes that's confusing or scary. But for me, it happened because when I graduated college, I was a teacher. I graduated with a teaching degree and I went to teach in high school. But at that time, I could not get a position in tenure, meaning a permanent position. And the reason I couldn't do that was, believe it or not, the Vietnam War. Because well, every single, at the time, all right, in the early 70s, 72, 73, in the early times then at the height of the Vietnam War, any male that became a teacher was exempt from the draft exempt from going, which meant there was an influx of male teachers, which meant there were more teachers than there were students. So I could not get a permanent position in a job, which meant as a teacher, I was bouncing around from school to school. I teach a semester and then teach someplace else and then teach another semester and teach someplace else. Anybody that taught in the early 70s knows exactly what I mean. So resourceful as I am, and I have always been, I answered an ad in the Times in the wanted section saying, be a travel agent, discovery tours, visit the United States, work and travel, work and travel. So I got a job as a receptionist there. And after two weeks, I became a travel agent, which meant that I would make reservations for people to go away. And on top of that, I would escort people when they were away. So I would take a whole bunch of people to San Francisco and we'd get on the tour bus and I would go with somebody and I would tour them all the way down from San Francisco to Los Angeles. So we, we, we went down um, different coastal tours and that began my travel career. And as I continued forward, I worked for some very famous travel people. As some of you will know, I worked for Arthur Froman Tours, which produced um, British Airways London show tours and Europe on $10 a day and all of these things things that I'm sure the boomers out there will begin to relate. And because of that, and because we were in an era where travel was luxurious, just like that movie, Catch Me If You Can, with Leonardo DiCaprio. I love that, that Yes, that was the lifestyle that I lived. So it was nothing for me to take a ticket from the drawer and go away. And if I wanted a pair of shoes in Rome, I would fly on Thursday and come back on Sunday. I would just go out and do what I wanted because travel was so easy and the privileges for travel agents so abundant. So we would stay in luxurious hotels. We would fly first class. I flew one of the inaugural Concords several times. Just amazing things. And of course, I did it the way Robin Leach would have been proud. Lifestyles of the rich and famous came my way. And I was enthralled. Here was the world. And how could you turn down the world? I know that you are very well traveled as well, Em, so that you understand it really does open you up to other things and really does not make the world a very small place. It allowed me to venture out and see that there were many more things to learn, many more people to meet and um, many more things to do. That's absolutely incredible. And I am so jealous that you got to experience the Concorde. I, I would have loved to have traveled even just once, even just sat in the Concorde and you went twice. That is so exciting. But I have to ask, I mean, you were in travel, you were a travel agent, but was there any stigma attached when you were traveling as a solo female or were you not traveling as a solo female? Sometimes I was. Most of the time I was traveling with friends and people in the industry. Um, sometimes I traveled with boyfriends. Sometimes we traveled in a group. So um, the stigma didn't come from that because I usually traveled as a tour leader. So I would escort people. Um, so that it was perfectly acceptable to do that, especially since I had the company behind me. I've only traveled as a single person late in life and only for um, for uh, vacation a couple of times. And I'll tell you, I would recommend it highly. 
Once in your life, you have to take a solo vacation. It's absolutely mesmerizing. And for me, some of the best experiences I've ever had. And I think when people solo travel, they often recall tales of how they really grew in confidence. Why, why would that be? Well, it's simply because you're only dependent upon yourself and you're put in situations and circumstances that are not comfortable for you so that you have to find a way to find comfort and also find a way to navigate so that you can do the things you want to do. And I think that's a wonderful thing. But more than that, because there are ways, travel is easy. You can always find a group of single people. You can find a tour to, to hop onto. You can, you can hire an escort. But the best thing about traveling on your own is that you don't have to make decisions with other people. If you want to have lunch at, at 11 o'clock in the morning and dinner at 10 o'clock at night, or you want to travel to a different town, or you want to see a different tour, you only have yourself to answer to. And I think people really get a chance of seeing who they are when they realize that there's no one else around to either give advice or ask opinions. That's how you really grow, understanding what your needs are and what you truly want. And that alone, I brought into my coaching. Wow. I, and I can certainly see that. And I would absolutely recommend that people do try and travel alone. And I think having that moment in time where it's just you calling the shots and discovering who you are is so, so important. And I'm not sure if you want to go here, but I do know that perhaps once or twice you found yourself in uh, partnerships and marriages where you were not particularly happy, where you weren't just calling the shots for yourself. And I know now you've chosen, you've made the choice to be self-partnered. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Because it's fascinating. I can, you know, if you've been through marriages, then you have the experience of marriage. And again, looking back at both marriages, and I had two of them, I have absolutely no regrets. The only thing that I would suggest to every single person that wants to be in a relationship and eventually get married is, do you honestly believe that a partnership and a marriage is exactly right for you? Or is it something that you think should be chosen for you because of the age that you are or because of what your parents might be saying or what society may deem normal or expected at that particular stage of your life? And that's what happened for me the first time around. When I married back in the 70s, I basically married because it was not proper etiquette for a single girl to live on her own. And no matter what, even though I was this hippie rebellious kid, there was something in me that was still very 50s and very, and I know the boomers are going to know this, very father knows best and Donna Reed and my three sons in me, all of those things, the Ozzy and Harriet way of life, that you do the proper thing and you get married so that you are considered a proper lady and that you are not single and out there and a wanton woman, so to speak. So instead of doing that, I got married and I got married very young. I got married at 20. We were still in college. I went to college. We finished up college together um, and realized that in 11 years, even though I was seeing him for 13, we were married for 11. In 11 years, we were still very much children, very much children. And we parted ways. And I have no regrets. And we had some really, really good times. It also introduced me to being married to a musician, which he was, which was really an experience. I got to be a band widow for 11 years and watch him do gigs and, and watch him run around and, and have me do my thing. Um, in addition, I also got to travel the world. So we became ships passing in the night and decided um, 11 years later to call it quits. And that was my first experience. 
I lasted until um, all of my 30s. All of my 30s was was actually supposed to be my 20s. But I did all of those things in my 30s. And then I married again. And I married again for security. And um, it was lovely while it lasted. But it was not what I wanted. And it just wasn't for me. And what I realized through both marriages was that I would have been much happier not being married. And the thing of it is, M, to this day, no matter what, no matter where you are in your life, no matter what you have gone through, the feelings around it and society still have difficulty accepting a single woman that is extremely happy being single. Don't you think so? Don't you agree? Oh, absolutely. You know that I have for the past few years been in an absolutely impossible marriage where I have been giving and giving and giving as much as I possibly could and holding on thinking if I'm strong enough, if I'm smart enough, I can be the perfect wife, the perfect stepmother, the perfect partner, the perfect businesswoman, trying to be everything everybody else wanted me to be. And it wasn't until you came into my life that I realized that's not what I wanted. I was trying to be everything to everyone except what I needed for myself. And you were such a breath of fresh air when you came into my life telling me it's okay not to know what you want right now. It's okay to put yourself first. And now being a woman who is separated, going through divorce, and really in my early 30s, discovering for the first time who I am on my terms and doing what I want to do, nurturing myself, nurturing my business, and being able to do that with the different tools that you've given me through being my coach for over a year now, I feel so much more empowered and it doesn't bother me anymore the way it used to when people to this day say, so when are you deciding to maybe next get married? Aren't you going to maybe think about having some kids soon? Time's a ticking, that biological clock's gonna kick in any day now. And I'm just thinking this time's for myself. And Ellen says that's okay, so, it's definitely okay. <laughs> it really becomes your own path to your own authenticity. And that's uh, that's a good friend of mine who, who coined that phrase. And I'll give that credit to Tom Gentry, uh, my dear shout out to Tom and his podcast. So you should take a listen. But part of that is understanding that if you want to be in a couple, if you feel that a relationship is nurturing, if you feel that being with someone is an enhancement in your life, by all means, go straight for it. But understand that in that coupling, you as an individual, your individual identity must be present. I always talk to my clients and talk to them about two things, compromise and sacrifice. And I know we've talked about this. Compromise means that if I want to do something and you want to do something, that we agree to do either a combination of those things or what the other person wants, providing that we're both still happy in that decision. Because if you're not happy in that decision, then you haven't made a compromise. You've made a sacrifice. And in making a sacrifice over and over again, many things happen, like it did in my first marriage. You build up resentments. You build up anger. You feel as if your voice isn't truly being heard. And all you are doing is maybe suppressing the conflict. Or all you are doing is shutting off your own identity and, and relying in a codependent way on what your partner wants and needs. Both of those things are completely unhealthy and, as we all know, are not sustainable. Eventually, you're going to explode in some way. You're going to run in the other direction. And it happens over and over and over again. So the trick is not to lie to yourself. 
The trick is to be perfectly honest with who you are. And if you want to be a single pushy broad, and that is where you shine, then it's your life and you are entitled to shine. That is a beautiful message. And you you really picked on a couple of great words there. You mentioned authenticity. And now that we're talking a bit more about your uh, different counseling work and your coaching work, um, I really want to talk about that authenticity because I think that that is what makes you shine as a coach. You are so incredibly authentic because you don't just talk the talk, but you've walked the walk and you've been through certain things that other people might not often want to share. And one part of your work is the life coaching. Another is to do with addiction recovery. And like I said, you've walked the walk. Can you tell us a little bit more about perhaps your struggles with addiction in the past? When you uh, participate in something that you know is your calling, you realize that every fiber of your being calls you to that. It's a very strange thing. And I'm not usually a sentimental feelings kind of person in that way, but I am a spiritual person. So I cannot deny that when something is calling me, I must go in that direction. And the reason is because recovery is a part of my life, not only a part of my life, but it's seemingly a part of my soul. And I'll explain to you why. You are very correct in saying that I have walked the walk and I've also walked on the coals. In recovery, recovery has beginnings, which means we have addiction beginnings and everybody will tell war stories of uh, how many drugs they consumed and what happens with them and how many scars they've had and how many times they've landed in jail or maybe they've been in treatment. I mean, it's a, it could be a plethora of war stories. Understanding that some of mine really do stand out with smoking pot starting at 14 years old simply because I wanted to and I wanted to get high and I wanted to feel good about it. And just kind of being what they call a garbage head, meaning I didn't care what kind of drugs I was taking as long as it was, it was going to give me a high, an up, a down, a whatever, a, you know, it didn't matter. It just didn't matter. But the thing that separates us is that there's a difference between doing something and doing it to excess abusing something. And I didn't really know until much, much later that even though there's a certain modicum of normalcy in terms of socially casually drinking or maybe casually smoking or casually partaking, an addict can never do that ever because there's no such thing as casually doing anything. So once I found out that I was doing a tremendous amount, it was impossible for me to stop. And a lot of that ruined my early existence. And it ruined my childhood. It certainly ruined my college years, which got me very close to expulsion with, a, with an overdose that, that was life-threatening. I can't tell you how many cars I cracked up. I don't know how my parents made it through my college years because I barely did. I can't believe I got a bachelor's degree. It's like amazing. <laughs> amazing. I'm, I really don't remember much of anything. But I can tell you that I knew that this was not going to work out. And for me, it was in my early 30s. So I really had a very, very long existence, early existence, enmeshed in drugs. And not realizing at all that I had a problem. I never realized that even though everybody was doing drugs, like a girlfriend of mine said, I did more because I didn't know how to stop. And then finally, through no fault of my own, really kind of like backdoor situation, someone I was seeing decided to stop doing drugs. So they went to a 12-step program and they started going to meetings in a 12-step program. 
And then they came back speaking this language of recovery and talking about recovery and talking about one day at a time and talking about 12 steps and talking about a change and a, and a reflection and a spirituality and the disease of addiction. And I'm like, this person is talking a foreign language and I don't understand it. So for people that don't understand it or people that are loved ones of people that have addiction problems, there are other 12 step meetings to go to so that you can learn a little bit about the addiction and how it's affecting you as a loved one of that person. So I kept going to those. And one night I went to one and unbeknownst to me, I walked into the addiction meeting and I started to walk out the door because I thought it was the wrong meeting. And somebody pulled me in the door, a really cute guy, by the way, and said, come on and sit down. I said, ah, it's a cute guy. I'll sit down. Yeah, why not? What the hell, right? Yeah, it was really cute. And I sat down and I was in the Narcotics Anonymous meeting and I'm listening to all this stuff about what an addict does and how they can't stop and how they feel and how they go on just benders for days. And, you know, you got to take ups to stay up and down to stay down. And that was me, 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 me. And I'm like, what the hell? I can't believe it. There's like a thing here. It's real. I have a real problem. And not only that, I'm not the only one that has a real problem. And that's the most important thing. That was really the first step for me. And that happened in my early 30s. And I am like, eyes wide open. And what took me in was the community of people involved. Because there literally was a community and they literally pulled me in. And it was a very small community on Staten Island, which which being a Bronx girl, I can tell you, I lived there for a year and it's kind of like the forgotten borough and everybody on Staten Island, I love you, I miss you, but that's who you are, okay? That's who you are. Anyway, <laughs> And this was a long time ago. There was only one meeting or two meetings on Staten Island so that everybody went to get you. So if you didn't want to come to a meeting, the whole meeting came to get you. <laughs> so I couldn't get away from it. And the thing is that I developed a sense of community, which is why I knew from the very beginning that sobriety was not just not picking up a drink or a drug. The only way to survive in sobriety is to understand community. Because, and the reason for my entire being here, we can't do it alone. We just can't do it alone, right? You had trouble reaching out. You didn't have an addiction problem, but you were married to someone with an addiction problem, which made it a problem for you because you had no understanding of what's, what was going on. And if you didn't reach out for help, God knows where you would be today. Oh, absolutely correct. And when I hear you talking about community, it, it really did remind me of the connection we made when I came to you in my darkest hour, not understanding how to help the person that I was more in love with than anyone else in the world, more in love with than even myself. And I was desperate to find someone who could help me help this person that I was so attached to. And it really was a very codependent relationship, which is what you did open my eyes to. And you were so approachable. You had such an understanding of the different kinds of things that were going on in my marriage that even I couldn't see. I was so close to the problem with no understanding whatsoever, no point of reference ever in my life for helping or being around anybody with any kind of addiction issue, um, that you were able to reach into me and communicate with me in a way that other people couldn't. Because every single person who I had spoken to, not that there were many, because you have to understand, I had a lot of shame around my marriage because I felt like a failure somehow I was lacking and therefore my relationship wasn't perfect the way that I was portraying on social media you reached into me and helped me to understand exactly what was going on exactly what the issues were and how I couldn't change anything in my marriage apart from my own behavior and that was a revelation to me because anybody else that I'd spoken to also had this feeling of shame and secrecy around my relationship 
I reached out to a few family members and as much as I love them and they love me and they want to be there for me and vice versa, again, they'd never encountered this issue before. And they thought, how do you go from having this seemingly perfect relationship to suddenly telling us that things are not quite correct? Just stick it out a bit longer. Just be a little bit stronger. I'm sure he'll come around eventually. Every marriage goes through its ups and downs. But this is not what was happening. It was such a toxic environment. And it was truly slowly hurting me and killing me to give and give and give so much. And I was in such crisis at the beginning that even though my partner did not want your help and refused the help that I was appealing to you for, you turned around to me and said, hey, I think you and I should work together. And at first I was reluctant, but really you did find a way of making me feel like there was no shame, that I was not alone and that perhaps I'm not I'm not lacking. I'm not a, a huge problem, but there is a problem that we need to deal with. And you really reached me in a way that nobody else could, because if you forgive my French, there was no BS there. You didn't tell me that things will just be fine. We'll work through it. I, you didn't give me all these false promises. You held me accountable. And as you said, you were part cheerleader and part drill sergeant because you gave me exercises to do. You expected me to do those exercises and slowly, slowly, as reluctant as I was, I started to see clearer. The veil of mystery around my partner's addiction started to lift and I started to have, with your help, an understanding of what was happening, which made me feel a lot more empowered and ultimately brought me to the realization but I couldn't control the issue or change it, but I could change my own fate and destiny and that it was no good for me pouring so much of myself into a broken cup I could never fulfill because the person that I was trying to pour all of myself into didn't want to change. Either they didn't want to or they weren't ready. So you stuck by me through all of the highs and lows and you saw how messy things got and you never left. You never bolted and you were there for me 110%. That's overwhelming and thank you so much. And I really do feel as if that is my only job for my clients, okay? It's not something I did because I even knew who you were or what you do, it didn't matter to me. We were talking about that from this point of view. The reason I am so tenacious with my clients, the reason I am so this is what it is and this is how you get around it is because when you really, really go through the disease of addiction and you know it, not only because you have studied it for 16 years in a behavioral health situation, which is what I did when I left the travel industry to go into behavioral health, but see it from an addict's point of view, understanding that an addict in recovery gets a chance to get down in there and understand the behavior of somebody that mimics their own behavior. So understanding the addictive brain, understanding what an addict go through, goes through and understanding what a family goes through and what kind of questions that family will have and what a family is actually capable of doing and what they're not capable of doing, which is why I really had to go in sometimes and I still have to go in sometimes with my clients and what I did with you was mentally and physically almost pull you out because there is no knowledge as to what's actually going on. So because of that, I kind of have a cheerleader drill sergeant approach, meaning I am always in your corner, but I as a pushy broad will constantly be pushing you forward towards what I consider to be emancipation. I completely agree. And there are so many instances when you were working with me that I truly believe that if I was not able to reach out to you, I don't think I'd be sitting here today in the position that I'm in, perhaps not even alive, because the situation was absolutely critical and it was dire. And although I can't go into absolute specifics, I really don't think that I would be here today. 
And you were one of the only people that I could turn to who had a thorough understanding of what was truly going on in my life. And I called you up in crisis so many times, so afraid, so worried for everything that was happening in my life that I couldn't understand or control. And you were able to break things down for me in a tangible step-by-step process just to get through the next minute, the next hour, the next day, the next week, until I was at a strong enough point that I could pull myself with your help and the help of friends out of that situation because I needed to be out. And looking back at who I was just a year ago, less than a year ago, the woman I was, the girl that I was, was unrecognizable. And I really do feel that this year, I've come so far with your help and the help of our team over at Women Who Push For More and Pushy Broad From The Bronx. I've really grown into myself. And today on Instagram, I put out a post just saying, when I look at the woman that I'm becoming, she gives me shivers. And my present self and my past self are so proud because I didn't think that I would ever be here. And I really do have you to thank for that. I really, really do. I thank you for that. And I'm extremely proud of your progress. When you can see the light surrounding you, you know you've gone in the right direction. I had no idea exactly where it was going to go, but I knew that extinguishing your light was not the right thing to do. And you can have that feeling and you know it no matter what. And sometimes, like you said, you need somebody to say, you need to get on that path and you need to not stop until you can break free. And it is not your fault. And you do not have to live like this. And you do not have to spend the rest of your life in pain or in confusion. There is a better way. Education, uh, knowing that someone is there in your corner that truly understands you and is going to give you a feeling of, yes, I can, rather than no, I can't. And that feeling for you was, you know, it took a while, but when it came, the momentum just had it spill over. And the the work that you have done over the past year has evolved to a level that is quite outstanding. But more than that, the light around you, the way you are smiling, the way you are helping others, the way that you have decided to join my team because you believe in this movement, because it has worked for you in such a great way because you understand that recovery coaching is vital whether you are an addict or a person that is suffering with someone that's an addict is really amazing and you've also expanded that because it was not only based in addiction but we as women push for more in every facet of our lives and this team is expanding on all of that We push for more for our kids. We push for more in our relationship. We push for more as individuals, in our careers, in every facet of our lives. And that becomes such a powerful thing that this movement is really uh, amazing. And I'm so glad you're a part of the team. Thank you. It feels amazing to be part of the team. And I really do believe in our mission and, and our goal to inspire others to embrace their inner pushy broads. I was brought up in a a very safe home environment, a very traditional uh, two parents, two siblings, and uh, uh, very hardworking and well-to-do families, but very safe, very secretive, very much uh, don't step outside the comfort comfort zone, don't embarrass the family. Um, and, And when I encountered real life for the first time and real life issues, I thought that what I should have been experiencing was what I was seeing in the Disney movies that I was allowed to watch as a child. I was expecting to be a Disney princess with a prince who would come along and sweep me off my feet on a white horse and get married and have children. And that was what was expected and it would be wonderful. And I never knew that I might find somebody who was narcissistic or had their own addiction issues and how to deal with that. And a, a huge part of my upbringing was also 
uh, as much as my parents really did try their hardest with me based on their own upbringings, was very much to be as feminine and as polite and as dainty as possible, which if anybody knows me, is so the opposite of who I am. I want to be running around, you know, partially clothed and wrestling various animals out in the wild. That's <laughs> where I'm happiest, not sitting there, sitting pretty and, and smiling politely. Um, although I can play the part when I need to, I'm absolutely happiest out on adventures and, uh, uh, you know, charming king cobras and uh, capturing various birds and studying them and then releasing them. That's where I'm happiest. Um, and uh, you made me realize that embracing that part of me is absolutely okay because that's my superpower. And when I encountered somebody who I thought would embrace that and love me and want to spend the rest of their lives with me, not knowing that they were going to try and put me in a cage and that they would become so jealous of my own successes and try and squash that success. I didn't know what, what to do with that. I was so ashamed. Um, and you really did help me realize that I can open up the cage myself and liberate myself and exercise slowly over the last year my wings and realize that it's okay to want to push for more because traditionally the way that I've been brought up is not to push for more not to rock the boat not to speak too loudly not to draw too much attention to myself when I want to be seen I want to be heard I believe in my message and I want to have a community around me who also want to push for more and a year ago almost to this day I called you in crisis from my bathtub, which was empty, and I was in the fetal <laughs> position, crying and, and not understanding what I was going to do with my life and feeling like a failure. Whereas in the space of a year with your help, I've moved somewhere completely different. I feel very confident going through divorce. I'm not afraid anymore. I have a stronger community than ever before with my online work as Emzotic. And I've also started to work with various other companies, your own included, where I truly feel valued and feel like I can make a difference in positions and roles, which I never thought I was worthy of. But yet here I am. And you really did give me that gift. I gave you the tools. I gave you the confidence. Mm -hmm. I showed you some things. You have to have a set of tools, women especially, because we will call upon them to navigate. But we do have tools and they need to be enhanced and they also need to be learned because sometimes we feel less than. We feel as if our lives are there for another reason. Our lives are there for our children. Our lives are there for our parents. Our lives are there for our husbands. More women than everything, anybody else, okay? We have a far-reaching feeling of, I must do something for someone else on a regular basis. Or, I will not be good enough. I will be less than. And that only makes half a life. That makes someone that I consider to be living in one dimension. And it takes courage to say, I don't want this anymore. You may not know what you want, but it does take courage to say, this isn't right. This is no longer good for me. And I want everybody out there to know that there is help. Coaches are fantastic. I love working with women who want to push for more. It doesn't matter if you've come from a crisis situation or not, but you know you need something more than what you have right now. We'll figure it out together because you need a cheerleader. Just like M, someone to cheer you on and to say, yes, you're going in the right direction. And more importantly, saying, no, you're right. This is no longer right for you. And you have no power to change it. So decide which way are you going? My helping hand is here. And that's what I have devoted 16 years to, a helping hand to assist women who push for more, to assist people in recovery, to talk to people that are 
wondering about recovery because they're dealing with somebody that they think has an alcohol or drug problem or an eating disorder or a gambling disorder or a pornography disorder or a spending disorder or a money disorder or an organizational disorder, whatever, whatever. There are ways to get out of the abyss. The first way is to do what M did, and that would have been pick up the phone and call me. And my website is pushybroadfromthebronx.com. My 800 number is right there. It's 800-889-1757. It is always available, and it's the beginning of a new life. This is a new year. For me, it's also the beginning of a new year and a new thing. I'm constantly learning from my clients. I am constantly growing and expanding. We have great plans for women who push for more, don't we, Em, for 2021? Oh, absolutely. And our team is, I mean, shout out to the whole team over at Women Who Push For More and Pushy Bra from the Bronx, because what a great team of women who all have their own incredible stories and who've come from such incredible different backgrounds. Um, there's so many intelligent women in our group who have all been through the wars in their own way and come out a lot stronger, having done the work that is necessary to really hold themselves accountable and make a change because accountability is so important. And I think that that's something that a lot of people uh, shy away from because they don't want to put things up on the whiteboard the way that you teach your clients. They don't want to really pop the hood and have a look at what's going on in their own minds. They just want a magical quick fix, fix my life up and let me move on. Whereas actually the road and journey to self-improvement, it's a long one and it can be messy and uncomfortable at times, but oh my goodness, is it so worth it. And doesn't it not just give you such a wonderful, strong foundation from which to really be honest with yourself and authentic and embracing of yourself, of your own talents and being able to just think, what is my message? Where am I going? And to really find a way to live your most authentic life and to evolve. We're constantly evolving. And I think evolution is extremely important. And Certainly for me, when I look back at who I was a year ago, when I stepped away from the awful situation I was in, which you really helped to remove me from, I was waiting for a long time to feel like my old self. And then I realized I am never going to feel like my old self again. And thank goodness for that, because that person no longer serves me. She doesn't live here anymore. I found all of my broken pieces and I put them back so much stronger in a brand new form. And I would not have been able to do that without the tools that you gave me and without the constant work. I mean, we work together several times a week. And I'm sure many people would find that prospect exhausting. But truly, for the rest of my life, one little year, a year is not that long, one little year of putting in the work every single day, holding myself accountable, looking at every single decision I make and thinking, is this healthy thinking, has been so monumentally changing in my life. And I've evolved past what I truly thought that I could in the next 10 years. And I've done it in 10 months. And I, I just shudder to think where I'll be with your help another year from now. And the work that we'll do together over at Women Who Push For More and Pushy Broad in the Bronx. Well, it's a great evolution for sure. And certainly perfect for the beginning of the year. And I want to make that kind of awareness and emancipation available to all of my listeners. So we have devised a scheme kind of a plan going forward for 2021. And that universal theme is that we're going to talk about how to push for more in a healthy way. And most importantly, we're going to communicate as a community with the fact that recovery, being in recovery, is part of the emancipation process. And it doesn't matter whether you are the person picking up the drink or the drug or not, or whatever you are doing. Let's talk about recovery in a good way, recovering back to good mental health. 
with guidelines, with the pushy broad, with all of the things that make it real. So for the month of January, we're going to take a look at some of the things that helped me recover. And every single month, we're going to focus on a different tool, a different step that makes it more e more uh, easily accessible to you. And just like M said, the first month of January is the awareness step. It's awareness. I want to move forward. You don't have to know how yet. You just have to know that what you have may be good, but you may want more. Or maybe what you have isn't good enough and you want to make a change. Whatever it is, you want to take another step further in doing something more for yourself, in knowing yourself better, in making decisions that will enhance your existence. So in the awareness step, the things that I've learned in 12-step recovery is that I am powerless over my addiction. My life was unmanageable. I could not pick up a drink or a drug. But for you in recovery, that may actually mean that you have decided that you can't change the world. You are powerless over changing anybody else. And you also have to understand that maybe your, your thinking became addictive thinking. So that you were constantly thinking the same thing over and over again. I can't make a change. I can't do this. I, I'm afraid to do this. I'm scared to do this. I can't move forward. That is the cycle of addictive thinking that is not working for you. So let's break free of it. If your life is unmanageable or your life needs to change for the better, this is what January is going to be about. Find it. If you are unsettled and uneasy, give in to that feeling. Stop shoving it under the rug. Stop escaping from it. Stop running in the other direction. The pushy broad is here to tell you that I will be your mirror, your anchor, and your conscience, like I tell all of my clients. I want to hear from you talk to us. We want to discuss the things that are bothering you. We'll put it up on the whiteboard and I'll examine it. We'll give you great ideas so that you can move forward with courage and with community behind you. That's the mission of Pushy Broad. I want to identify other Pushy Broads in the awareness, in the steps to recovery. And I really, really do hope that you will join us in 2021. That is so inspiring, Ellen. And I have to say, as we've spoken about in our team meetings, I really believe that times are changing and the stigma surrounding addiction and recovery is slowly going away. And there is more community than ever before. And I'm so just thrilled that you are taking this approach this year to help others understand recovery and addiction in a tangible way and helping to inspire more community because community is so important when it does come to recovery it's vital um, and not just recovery from addiction but also from past traumas as well I've not been through uh, an addictive uh, substance abuse myself, but I do know what it's like to be addicted to a person mm -hmm. and a way of thinking and unhealthy patterns which no longer serve me and which would serve nobody. So again, having community is not just for those who are going for uh, going through uh, addiction uh, in the more traditional sense, but also in a broader sense as well. And we would absolutely love to hear from all of you if you are willing to share your stories please do get in touch with Ellen or go and find us on our various social media um, which you can find at Pushy Broad from the Bronx uh, we constantly put out different kinds of content uh, via the wonderful team that we have um, and it's always with very not uh, a lot of content which will give you knowledge and make you feel empowered so please do come and be part of the community um, Ellen, I would love to know if you have to start us off in a very wonderful uh, 2021, any words of advice for anyone out there who's looking to be a uh, woman who pushes for more or a, a, a pushy bro from the Bronx, perhaps. 
being a powerful, unafraid, self-aware, hardworking, young at heart person gives you the energy to move forward. I truly want you to live your best life in 2021. I have owned Pushy Broad from the Bronx. I was always told that I was the loudest in the room or at least the one that had to speak my mind. It wasn't wanton. It wasn't without thinking. It was if you have something to say, it is your duty on this earth to say it. Those are the Pushy Broads and the Pushy Bros out there. I need you to understand that in 2021, it's all about owning that, being proud of who you are, which is why it's become my moniker and because why it's become my registered trademark. It is who I am and my no BS straightforward approach to things will really help to wake you up and set you straight. I don't know which direction you're going to go, but I want you to go there in a healthy way. I want you to feel as if you are truly empowered as a pushy broad or a pushy bro. So whether you wear the t-shirt or the sweatshirt on the merch page because you're proud to be a pushy broad or a pushy bro, or you turn to doing something on your own in isolation and say to yourself, I am going to take this first step, whatever it is. In 2021, it's time to be who you really are. And all I want to do is help you get there. I promise I'm with you every step of the way. Have a marvelous beginning to the new year. Stay with us throughout the 12 months. Every single one of them is going to be chock full of lessons and learning and fun people and inspiring and empowering people. And I am so grateful to Courtney and Maggie and Emma and Deborah. And I know that they're going to be here for 2021 because we all believe in women who push for more and what the Pushy Broad from the Bronx stands for. Thank you so much. Stay safe. This is Ellen Stewart, the Pushy Broad from the Bronx, saying thanks for listening. And remember, everybody needs a little push. From the pushy broad from the Bronx, New York.